Welcome back. This is video two for chapter 27. All right. So once we have a useful regression, how can we indulge our natural desire to predict without being irresponsible? Now we have standard errors. We can use those to construct a confidence interval for the predictions, smudging the results in the right, right way to report our uncertainty honestly. For our percent body fat and waist size example, there are two questions we could ask. Do we want to know the mean percent body fat for all men with a waist size of, say, 38 inches? Or do we want to estimate the percent body fat for a particular man, for an individual man with a 38-inch waist? The predicted percent body fat is the same in both questions, but we can predict the mean percentage body fat for all men whose waist size is 38 inches with a lot more precision than we can predict the percent body fat of a particular individual whose waist size happens to be 38 inches. Why? Because averages are much less variable than individuals. Okay? Remember that. Uh, just from our sampling distribution discussion. We start with the same prediction in both cases. We are predicting for a new individual, one that was not in the original data set, so it's a new person. Call his X value XV, 38 inches. The regression predicts percent body fat as Y hat V or YV hat equals beta not, or not beta not, B not, plus B1 XV. Both intervals take the form Y hat plus or minus T star N minus two stand times standard error. The standard errors will be different for the two questions we have posed. The standard error of the mean predicted value is SE mu V hat times this, it equals the square root time, uh, square root of SE squared of B1 times XV minus X bar squared plus the standard error of the, of the residual squared divided by N. Individuals vary more than means, so the standard error for a single predicted value is larger than the standard error for the mean you have to add in another factor of, or not another factor, another term of um, that standard deviation of the errors squared, the standard deviation of your residual squared. Keep in mind the distinction between the two kinds of confidence intervals. This is the really important part. The narrower interval is a confidence interval for the predicted mean value at XV. The wider interval is a prediction interval for an individual with that X value, okay? The confidence interval is for the average response. The prediction interval is for a particular individual. So if you keep your confidence level the same for both of them, the wider interval will be for an, inter uh, for an individual. The narrower interval will be for the mean response. Here's a look at the difference between predicting for a mean and predicting for an individual. The solid green lines near the regression line show the 95% confidence interval for the mean predicted value. See how close that is? That's a fairly narrow interval no matter where you go. If you just look from a green line to green line, it's just going to be a really small interval. The dashed red lines show the prediction intervals for individuals. So right here for like an in, a 30 inch waist, here's the lower bound for our confidence interval. Here's the upper bound that's very wide for prediction, I mean for, I said confidence interval, for prediction interval. Okay, very, very wide because that's for individuals. For the mean response, the confidence interval at say 30 inch waist is from green line to green line. Here's the lower bound, here's the upper bound. It's much more narrow. Okay, so what can go wrong? Don't fit a linear, linear regression to data that aren't straight. Okay, if a linear model just obviously doesn't fit when you're looking at your scatter plot, just stop. Okay, 
Watch out for the plot thickening. If this spread and Y changes with X, our predictions will be very good for some X values and very bad for others. Make sure the errors are normal. Check the histogram and normal probability plot of the residuals to see if this assumption looks reasonable. Remember, you're going to have to look at two plots for your residuals. A residual plot, which is just a scatter plot of the residuals, versus X, or the predicted Y values. And for that, in that, you're looking to make sure there's no underlying pattern left and there's no thickening in the spread. Then you need to look at a histogram and or normal probability plot of the residuals to see if they are plausibly normal, okay? Watch out for extrapolation. It is always dangerous to predict for X values that lie far from the center of the data, okay? If you wanted to know the percent body fat of a man with, you know, a 65-inch waist, this model may not work. Watch out for high influence points and outliers. Watch out for one-tailed tests. Tests of hypotheses about regression coefficients are usually two-tailed. So software packages report two-tailed p-values. 99.99% .99 of the time, what we're interested in is the null hypothesis, beta 1 equals 0, versus the alternative, beta 1 does not equal 0. If you are using software to conduct a one-tailed test about a slope, you'll need to divide the reported p-value in half. So if you're only interested in, you know, there's a positive linear relationship as your alternative, then you would divide the reported p-value in half. Okay, here's our example. One way to measure job satisfaction is to see how frequently people quit their jobs. And the following printout analyzes how often people quit their, their jobs at a particular company, so there's just at one company, based on different salaries with n equals 15. It compares hourly wages to quit rates. It's the quits per 100 employees. So if we look here, here is our regression equation. Our, our y value, our predictions, our y hats are going to be the quit rate. That's what we're predicting. Our x values are average wage. And so it's going to equal 4.86 minus 0 0.347 times the average wage. And that makes sense. It makes sense that the lower the average wage, the higher the quit rate. Okay, that's what the negative slope means, is that there, there's a negative relationship. That is, average wage gets higher, your quit rate gets lower. Okay? So, even if they didn't give us this up here, we could get our regression equation by looking um, right here at the coefficients. The constant coefficient is the y-intercept. The coefficient for the variable average wage, that's the slope. Okay? Here's the standard error or standard deviation of the residuals right here, the S equals 0 0.4862. And here's standard deviation for our y-intercept, standard deviation for our slope. We've got some t-ratios and p-values, and we'll use those later. We have r squared equals 72.9%, so that is our coefficient of determination. Okay, remember that means that 72.9% of the variability in uh, quit rate is explained by its linear relationship with average wage. R squared adjusted, we never use that. So, in fact, on a, on a, a, te a test or quiz or something, especially AP exam, just cross that out. We never use R squared adjusted. Okay, and here we have a fit. They, they'll tell us more about that later. There's, you know, an X value that was plugged in, and this is the uh, predicted quit rate that was generated. We've got the standard deviation. We have a confidence interval and a prediction interval. Okay, so let's just get started. Part A, what is the explanatory variable, the response variable, the correlation, and the p-value for significance test of slope? That's another way of saying a linear regression t-test, uh, a test for linearity. All those mean the same thing. All right, your explanatory variable is your x variable, so it's average wage. Your response variable is quit rate. Your correlation is going to be either the positive or negative square root of r squared. And you have to look at 
your slope to tell whether you need it to be positive or negative. Since our slope is negative, that means the relationship is um, a negative linear relationship. And so you want to take the square root of 0.729 and then apply a negative to it. So if you take the square root of 0.729, it is approximately 0.854. And we do want this to be negative. The p-value for a significance test of the slope we look right up here on our slope line, the line that's average wage. We see our T ratio is negative 5.91 and our P value is 0, 0.00. And again, this is for the null hypothesis that beta 1 equals 0 versus the alternative beta 1 is not equal to 0. So this can be referred to as a significance test for a slope. Like I said a minute ago, it also could be a test for linearity and it could also uh, be called a linear regression t-test. Do the data present sufficient evidence to conclude that average hourly weight contributes useful information for prediction of quit rates? What does the model suggest about the relationship between quit rates and wages? Well, yes, due to our low value, uh, our low p-value of 0, 0.00, we have evidence that Literally, our slope is something other than zero, and what that means for us is that there is um, an, a useful contribution from hourly wage to information about quit rates. Um, the model, well, we have evidence that it's linear, and then if we look at our um, correlation, it was about negative 0.8, so that's a moderately strong negative linear relationship between our two variables. What is the predicted quit rate for a job that pays $8 per hour? Well, for this, you just simply plug in 8 as the average wage there, and you produce your quit rate. So x is the average wage, and y is quit rate. So y hat, our predicted quit rate, is going to be 4.86 minus 0 0.347 times 8. And so we get y hat equals 2.084. Construct a 95% confidence interval for the line and interpret. Okay, so that's going to be B1 plus or minus T star with N minus 2 degrees of freedom times the standard deviation of B1. So let's look. B1, that's our, our slope that we get from the data, rounds to be negative 0.347. And then we're going to have plus or minus, let's see, n is 15, so we need the critical value for 13 degrees of freedom. And then let's see, we've got the standard deviation for the slope, and we'll round to four decimal places there. We've got 0 0.0587. If you want to use as many decimal places as they show, that's fine. All right, so we use our handy T table, and we look at the row with 13 degrees of freedom. We find the critical value for 95% confidence, which is 2.160. So we plug that in, and we'll get negative 0 0.347 plus or minus 0 0.127. So negative 0 0.347 minus 0 0.127 is negative 0 0.474. And then we do negative 0 0.347 plus 0 0.127, and we get negative 0 0.220. Based on this data, we are 95% confident that on average, there is about a 0 0.22 to 0.47 decrease, because they're negative, in quit rate. For every additional, and then whatever your unit is for your x value, in this case, for every additional dollar in average hourly wage. A 95% prediction interval, PI, for the quit rate in an industry with an average hourly wage of $9 is given at the bottom of the printout. Interpret the result. So here we have it for $9. We, the actual prediction itself is 1.743. Prediction interval here is the for a an industry okay for a particular industry with an average hourly wage of nine dollars so this is for an individual and so we've got 0.656 to 0.2829 
We are 95% confident, we still use that language, based on this data, on average, an individual crit rate would be between 0 0.656 and 2.829 for $9 per hour. A 95% confidence interval for the quit rate in an industry um, with an, an um, a, average hourly wage of $9 is given at the bottom of the printout. Interpret the result. We are 95% confident based on this data that on average, the average of all quit rates will be 1.467 and 2.018 for $9 an hour. So much smaller, much more narrow interval for the average of all quit rates versus an individual quit rate. Suppose that the line for the entire industry is negative 0.6. Okay, so we're, we are changing things. Typically, your test for linearity, everything that they give us is going to have a null hypothesis that beta 1 is 0. Now we're going to have to do a test where beta 1 is equal to negative 0.6. We're going to conduct a test to see if the true slope for this particular company is negative 0.6. All right, so our null hypothesis will be that beta 1 equals negative 0.6. Our alternative will be that it doesn't equal negative 0.6. So instead of having B1 minus 0, we're going to have B1 minus negative 0.6. So that's where we get the negative 0 0.34655 minus negative 0.6 over 0 0.058666. And that is approximately 4.32. And we have 13 degrees of freedom. So for this, we're going to have to actually do the... Uh, cumulative distri distribution um, function for TCDF um, from 4.32 to infinity, everything 4.32 and larger, but we're going to have to multiply by 2 because it's a two-sided test. So we're considering everything at least as large as 4.32 and everything um, at least as small as negative 4.32. We have to consider the other side. And so that gives us 0 0.0008. So due to our small p-value of 0 0.0008, we reject the null. There is significant evidence that the true slope is not negative 0.6 for quit rate and hourly wage. Suppose that the y-intercept of the, the entire industry is zero. Okay, if you don't pay anything, you don't get any um, quitting. Based on the computer output, would we be correct? Uh, what would the, be the correct conclusion for a test of true y-intercept equals zero versus true y-intercept is not equal to zero? Okay, let me. Let me put that in there. Okay, so not equal to zero. Well, look at the constant row. This row right here, that's exactly what it's testing. So it's testing um, whether or not there is evidence that the y-intercept is not zero. Well, we have a p-value of pretty much zero. So the likelihood of getting a y-intercept of about 4.9 when the true y-intercept is zero is nearly impossible. Based on our small p-value of zero, there is significant evidence to reject the null. There is significant evidence that the true y-intercept is something other than zero for the quit rate and hourly wage, not the quit rate. Goodness, y'all are seeing too many typos there. Let me fix them real quick. And quit right there we go. All right, guys, that's it for this lesson. Um, next time in class, we will do quite a few problems in the rounds for Chapter 27. So come ready to go, and I will see you then. Bye.